Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Melissa Kivit, and I am the interim director at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. I want to uh, thank you for attending our second panel discussion of our Dykeman Discussions uh, panel series. And I would like to thank our panelists, Christian Enye uh, Crouch and Curtis Zuniga and Jeremy Dennis for participating in this panel titled Indigenous Communities of Greater New York. I would also like to thank Holy Trinity Church for hosting us today. Uh, and I would like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities and TD Bank for sponsoring our Dykeman Discussions lecture series. Dykeman Discussions is a two year discussion series focusing on exploring topics in early New York history, such as forced removal of indigenous people, Dutch colonization, enslaved labor, and immigration. Indigenous Communities of Greater New York is the second panel in a series of five taking place in 2023. In 2024, the museum will host a series of community dialogues to build on the panel discussions um, taking place this year. These dialogues will discuss issues that are important in today's social and political climate. We hope this project will allow members of the community to connect with each other, resulting in an even more unified community than the one that already exists in Inwood today. I would like to introduce you to our panel chair, Dr. Christian Ine Crouch. Dr. Crouch is Dean of the Graduate Studies and Associate Professor of Historical Studies and American and Indigenous Studies at Bard College. She is the author of the award-winning Nobility Lost French and Canadian Martial Cultures, Indians and the End of New France. And she has published essays and chapters on a wide range of topics in early colonial and er early modern Atlantic world history. Her current book project, Queen Victoria's Captives, A Story of Ambition, Empire, and a Stolen Ethiopian Prince, looks at the human and material culture consequences of the 1868 British Magdala expedition in Ethiop Ethiopia. And this work has received research support from Harvard University's Hutchins Center for African and African-American Research, the Yale Center for British Art, and the Georgian Papers Program. Since 2018, she has also researched, taught, and written about the intersection of history and contemporary, contemporary indigenous art, working as a curatorial advisor for the Brooklyn Museum's 2020 show, Jeffrey Gibson, When Fire is Applied to a Stone, It Cracks. As co-author for public programming for the Hessel Museum's Sky Hopinka, Centers of Somewhere, and interviewing Caddo sculptor Raven Half Moon. So there will be a chance for the audience members to ask questions and engage with our speakers after they have presented. And now I will give the floor to Dr. Crouch. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank Richard Tomsock of Stony Brook University, Melissa and Caroline, and the whole team at the Dykeman Farm Museum Alliance for developing this series. Um, my name is Christiane Ine Crouch, and I am today's moderator. It is my very great pleasure to be here today with Curtis Zuniga and Jeremy Dennis. The format for today is I will introduce my panelists. And then I, then Curtis, then Jeremy will each present for about 10 minutes on the broad topic of Indigenous communities of greater New York. Then we'll turn to a structured discussion drawn from some questions that I pose Curtis and Jeremy. And then I'll open the floor for a period of Q&A for both our in-person and online participants. So let me introduce today's panelists. Curtis Zuniga is an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. He has 40 years of experience in tribal government and administration, community development, telecommunications, and cultural preservation. He is a specialist in Delaware Lenape culture, language, and traditional practice, and a veteran of the US Air Force. He is also the co-founder and co-director of the Lenape Center based in Manhattan and led by Lenape elders. The Lenape Center has the mission of continuing Lenape hawking, 
the original homeland in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania through community, culture, and the arts. Since 2009, Lenape Center has created programs, exhibitions, workshops, performances, symposia, land acknowledgments, and ceremonies to continue the Lenape presence. Lenape Center is working toward the creation of a physical culture center. Jeremy Dennis is a contemporary fine art photographer and a tribal member of the Shinnecock Indian Nation of Southampton, New York. In his work, he explores indigenous identity, culture, and assimilation. He received a Dream Starter grant for his project on this site, which uses photography and an interactive online map to showcase culturally significant Native American sites on Long Island. He holds an MFA from Pennsylvania State University and has been the recipient of numerous awards and residencies, including at Yaddo, Birdcliff Artist Colony, and the Vermont Studio Center. His work has been exhibited at many places, including the Parish Art Gallery, the Art Gallery at Stony Brook University, and the Emily A. Wallace Gallery. Jeremy has since 2020 led Ma's House, which includes an arts residency on the Shinnecock Reservation for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as hosting an array of history and arts programming for tribal members and the local surrounding community. And I wanna thank uh, Jeremy and Curtis in advance for being here today. I know I voice everyone's sentiment when I say how eager I am to hear the wisdom and the insight that you're gonna share. So as an opening to my own remarks, I wanna recognize that I am an uninvited settler in the homelands of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohegan Indians, where Bard College is located. Confronting and recognizing this position has animated much of the work that I have undertaken as a researcher and in my time at Bard College. And what I will focus on in my remarks is to give some broad context as to why I think having a space for conversations like this one is so important and why the work that Curtis and Jeremy are doing is so critical. I am a historian of the early modern Atlantic world and Native American and indigenous studies. And my route into this field comes from my personal experience. I was born in Addis Ababa to an Ethiopian mother and to a foreign service officer. And I spent my childhood mostly overseas as a result of my dad's job. This made the United States a place that was not entirely familiar to me. And as a third culture kid, the exchanges of the colonial Atlantic world actually helped to make me feel grounded where I otherwise experienced isolation. I wrote my undergraduate senior thesis on French colonial and indigenous, especially Haudenosaunee or Six Nations relationships in the 17th century. And when I came to NYU for graduate school, I shifted forward by a century to look at the ways in which indigenous peoples, um, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Wabanaki, had shaped and influenced French colonial policy, military culture, and imperial decisions during the Seven Years' War in the 1750s and 60s. Now, when you work on the 17th and 18th century Atlantic world, you don't encounter the same degree of marginalization and erasure of indigenous peoples because all of your sources emphasize indigenous presence. In the past 40 years or so, as a result of indigenous activism and the rise of Native American and indigenous studies, Historians and other scholars have pivoted to not only include, but also to center the place of native peoples in this period. Sovereign indigenous nations are typically an important part of the narrative for early US history education in college, in K to 12, and in US popular culture up until around 1776. But then, despite the abundance of the actual historical record, what gets disseminated is an inevitable narrative of decline. There is typically a brief reappearance of Western nations like the Lakota, Apsalika, or Diné in the late 19th century, tied to that very useful euphemism, westward expansion. And then most Americans seamlessly return to the comfort of vanishing and disappearing narratives. We mourn the loss of native peoples and generally accept this unquestioningly and get on with our own interests. And I'll be returning to this point in just a minute. I wanna note that because of my own experience in research, that the erasure of Native Americans from historical and political records is even worse in France and in much of Europe than it is in the US and Canada. These days, there are the beginnings of a limited engagement by European nations and institutions with the role and responsibilities of Europeans in the transatlantic slave trade and in colonization on the African continent, and probing the ways in which European states and private individuals 
gained tremendous capital from the violent theft of the labor and lives of African men, women, and children. But there is almost no recognition or discussion in these countries about the legacies of interaction with or contemporary obligations to Native Americans. You might think to yourselves, well, but Native Americans are in the Americas, not Europe. And let me assure you that indigenous travelers have been going westwards from the 1490s until today. This erasure has real implications for indigenous descendant communities. And let me give you just one example. France is a major global center for auction houses specializing in historic works of art, including indigenous cultural material, sacred items, and culturally significant documentation. But the auction houses and the French government are able to distance themselves from addressing the complaints and claims of descendant communities in three ways. First, the loss of New France or the end of French empire to Britain at the Treaty of Paris in 1763 provides the French state a convenient excuse to dissociate itself from any direct responsibility to indigenous communities. In this line of thought, Britain, and now the United States, bear the burden of repairing, if they choose, the effects of dispossession and of enslavement and indentured labor directed at indigenous individuals before and then alongside people of African descent. There is a studious lack of recognition that European monarchies and nation states engaged with one another and with the United States to enact treaties that carved up indigenous homelands without indigenous consultation or consent. Second, although there has been legislation since 1990, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act or NAGPRA to enforce the return of remains stripped by the state of ancestors, spiritual beings, and culturally significant material to federally recognized tribes, NAGPRA only applies domestically. It cannot be used by federally recognized tribes to seek repatriation from, say, a French auction house overseas. And NAGPRA is a tool open only to federally recognized tribes, leaving state recognized or unrecognized tribal nations no recourse. Third, U.S. education and cultural production since 1783 has placed a premium on actively vanishing Indians as what Ojibwe scholar Jean O'Brien brilliantly calls firsting and lasting in her 2010 book of the same name. Firsting means celebrating the first Euro-American moments of historical significance. The first English discovery of what colonists call the Hudson River, the first white child born in the Americas, the first trading house built in Manhattan. From about 1840 onwards, state governments in the Northeast embarked on a festival of signage to celebrate firsting and to cement colonial rights to land and place. They combined this with the lasting of indigenous peoples summed up by the title of James Fenimore Cooper's 1826 novel, The Last of the Mohicans. Spoiler alert, at the end of the novel or any cinematic adaptation, the character Chinachguk mourns the death of his son Uncas, cut down in the prime of his youth, making the elderly Chinachguk the last of the Mohicans. Lasting, emphasized through academic projects, journalism, policy papers, films, television, the disappearance of indigenous peoples, the disappearance of languages, of territory, of tradition, lasting firmly tied indigeneity to disappearance, and it lets settlers, rather than indigenous peoples themselves, adjudicate what can be authentic to any native nation. It remains a very popular and powerful concept. Um, a very popular version of Last of the Mohicans film came out in 1992. Lasting provides an important fiction that lets skeptical Americans and European players like French auction houses question any attempts at restorative justice by descendant communities. I feel the impact of lasting especially keenly because I live in Muncie and Mohican homelands. And I regularly have meetings with the cultural affairs department of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians who are in no way the last of. What Cooper presented as a romanticized mirage 
that obscured the very active and violent process of removal being forcibly directed at indigenous families throughout the Northeast in his lifetime. To Euro-Americans in places like New York, it was far more comfortable to imagine that native peoples had simply vanished rather than acknowledge their own place and part of being in this dispossession. Worse, many white abolitionists participated in this process, simultaneously supporting the end of slavery and the removal of their own indigenous neighbors. New York State and New York City have actively participated in these firstings and lastings, privileging the colonial European and Euro-American histories of belonging and place. I still regularly have students in my courses react with surprise when I talk about continuing Lenape, Mohegan, Wampanoag, Narragansett, or Oneida, to name a few, presence in the Northeast. Changing this culture is hard and ongoing work. For years, I resisted Bard, my home institution, writing a land acknowledgement because I didn't want more empty words on a page. I didn't want to be part of that. Only when we made a commitment as an institution to developing a living land acknowledgement in cooperation with the cultural affairs team of the descendant community and put real financial resources into living up to that commitment would this be a meaningful step forward. And one thing that was incredibly important to our partners was that Bard's land acknowledgement contained the words forced removal to make very clear that Muncie and Mohican individuals did not choose to leave their homes between the 1780s and 1839 but were forced under threat of violence by New York State, by land speculators, by their neighbors, and by the Indian Removal Act's federal policies of the 1830s. So this history, these Dykeman discussions, this presence here are all initiatives that push us forward to confront our actual past and build a better future. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Curtis to help expand what we're learning today. Thank you. <clears throat> I greet you in the Lenape language and uh, to say that uh, I am glad that you are here in the homeland on this island of Manahata or Manhattan in Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenape people. Um, now I'll try to keep on time here. Okay. Can everyone hear now? All right. Uh, <clears throat> as introduced, I am an enrolled member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. I'll explain that name and how it ties in with the Lenape. But first, let me give you uh, somewhat of an idea of what Lenape Hoking or land of the Lenape represents geographically and again preceded European contact. So the first, this map that's up now uh, overlays what is historically known as Lenape country. So we are like in the foothills of the Catskill Mountains and starting to come down the uh, Hudson River into New York City, a very important corridor of land between New York City and Philadelphia, all of New Jersey, uh, and then emptying out into the Delaware Bay. That's what's historically known as the homeland of the Lenape people, a people who lived in balance and harmony with all of creation, who had a sense that there was a living spirit in all of creation, be it the land, the water, the mountains, all animal life. When we live a lifestyle to be in balance and harmony with that. And when we did that, we gave thanks through ceremony and song and prayer. 
our lives were good. For centuries, the Lenape were known as, uh, in our language, Mahumsana, the, the grandfathers for our ancient presence, one of the first, one of the first tribal people known here in North America, in particular in this area of Lenape Hokie. And so with European contact came this clash of cultures. And one of them had to do with land and property. One of the most uh, egregious myths is the story of the purchase of Manhattan. Now, I will tell you from the perspective of a descendant, that's a myth, it's a lie. The Lenape did not willingly agree to accepting some uh, beads and baubles and ax heads in exchange for putting their mark on a piece of paper and selling the entire island of Manhattan. They didn't understand that concept. How can you sell something that is a gift from the creator that is our brother, that is our relative, our mother? How can you sell such a thing? How can you parcel it and put a title of ownership? We didn't understand that. And then the Dutch are looking at it like, well, here, we're giving you all of this stuff so that we can buy it. Put your mark on this paper, touch my hand, and it'll become ours. The Lenape understood it to be simply a right of common occupancy in their benevolent and egalitarian way. That's what the Lenape thought of it as. So we found out later that no, once you sign this, it belongs to us. So you leave our village and to make sure that you don't come back, they built a, a fortress around their village of New Amsterdam. Then they built around this wall that surrounded their village, they built a path that grew from a footpath to wide enough for horses and wagons to ultimately being paved into a street. Listen to the two major words I just said, because that is the name, the origin of Wall Street. The origin of Wall Street in what was the center of commerce on Manhattan Island for the Lenape people is the Wall Street that we know today in the center of commerce without the Lenape people on the island of Manhattan. It was the, the road around the wall that kept us out from our own land. That's the kind of uh, colonial legacy among many, many stories that we have. Ultimately a clash and in conflict with Dutch values that are centered on ownership, occupancy, transactional, uh, types of relationships. Ultimately, the British came in, moved the Dutch out and took over and renamed it New Amsterdam to New York. Then the British colonial governor who came up from Virginia to take over after the Dutch, he was Sir Thomas West, one of his titles of nobility. He was the third Lord D. La War. And so everyone started calling the great Lord Delaware and the River Valley and the native inhabitants, Lord de la War or Delaware. That's where our name came from. And we are now still, ever since the British, we, the Lenape people are called the Delaware. And the Delaware, uh, even today, as I said, I'm a enrolled member of the federally recognized Delaware tribe of Indians. Now there's a lot of story that goes with that too under Dutch, I mean, sorry, under British occupation. Um, ultimately, look, it was a tough time back then. I, I think Dr. Crouch spoke about some of the atrocities that occurred, not just to the Lenape, but so many indigenous people. I think of a 
1756. British directive. It was a scalp bounty, meaning you go out and you kill Lenape. They wanted to rid them from areas where they wanted to create land for more Europeans to come in and take over the land. They sanctioned legal murder and rewarded it. The scalp bounty was so you didn't have to do the cumbersome task of dragging dead bodies and you could scalp them, bring in their bloody scalps and get paid for that. Now, when you take that, when you take, you go all the way back to Europe and the Christian doctrine of discovery that says you go out and you take over the savages, you convert them to Christianity and you put them to work essentially as slaves. And it wasn't just the entirety of the Americas, but it was also the African continent, India, Southeast Asia, that whole British empire kind of thing. But with that attitude sanctioned by the, your leaders, then, and you're rewarded with money and land, that's, that's why indigenous people were run off. And that area of Lenape Hoking that you can see on this map, let's go to the next one, please. It'll be up there in that right-hand corner. You can see the shaded area of Lenape Hoking. And then you see all these arrows going in different directions. This occurred over a, a, a long period of time, decades, responding to issues that popped up during that time period. And so you've got people, some groups fleeing up into Canada, some across Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, some going down into even Texas and old Mexico, just looking for a place to get away from this constant <laughs> genocide, burning their crops and villages, killing men, women, and children to clear the land, to bring in their people, annexing land. I'm watching the clock. <laughs> now, folks, that can cause a major trauma on the people. And when you then take that over a period of decades, now you have historical and generational trauma. Kids born in a theater of warfare having to flee for their lives not knowing if they're going to make it through the day. That sounds kind of tough, right? But, you know, it's still going on today in Ukraine. If you want to picture what the Lenape went through, take a look at some of these stories in Ukraine. And the Lenape ultimately did not have the power to fight back. Even when they allied with the United States of America, when the new United States of America was founded, Thomas Jefferson called us merciless Indian savages in the Declaration of Independence. Go look it up, it's in there. Merciless Indian savages. And yet two years later, General Washington coveted the relationship with Lenape warriors who had a knowledge of geography and military intelligence, and they had warriors and they had provisions, and ultimately signed an agreement that became the very first Indian treaty with the United States of America on September 17, 1778, the treaty at Fort Pitt and the Delaware agreed to side with the Americans against the British and ultimately helped turn the Revolutionary War. The promise was equal representation as an Indian state in the new United States Congress, but like everything they said, it was, never intended to be uh, finalized. They told us a lot of things, but the only thing that they really ended up doing was they said they would take our land and they sure enough did it. So now my band of Delaware are out in Oklahoma and we've had to survive. We carry a, a, that generational historical trauma, but we have survived because we have our culture. 
even when there were efforts to destroy that, we held on to that. And the foundation of all things culture is language. As long as we can have our language, as long as we can pray to the creator in our language and, and are able to pass it down to young people to carry it on as it has through today, we will always be there. We will have fulfilled the obligation of, of accepting this legacy from our ancestors and the responsibility to hand, hand it off to our children. I am now manifesting that, that effort through a direct call from my organization that I work for, our nonprofit, Lenape Center, that calls for descendants to return to the homeland and take our rightful place at the table of power and to speak for ourselves, not have someone completely wipe us out and through erasure, but to recognize us and recognize that we have a right to take a, ta a place at the table of power, whether it's politics, religion, education, culture, music, whatever that table of power is, the Lenape should have a seat there and speak for ourselves rather than have someone speak for us. But we do so in a way, I'm not a government organization. I was in government quite a, for a long time, but we, we just want to have this dialogue and be recognized as the original indigenous people. New York has a ton of indigenous people in New York, but oftentimes they're indigenous to other parts of the US, other countries. They come to New York, the Lenape. And Jeremy and I are sitting here at this table. Uh, we are descendants of people who are indigenous to this land. That's why we have a special message, but it is to return to the homeland and also to embrace the gift of returning to our mother and to feel that we are no longer an orphan displaced from our original mother and we are welcome back. And that is how we heal and become well from generational and historical trauma. Um, oh, can everyone hear me pretty well? Oh, okay, <laughs> see you in the back. Um, well, my name is uh, Jeremy Dennis. I'm a artist and photographer from the Shinnecock Indian Nation all the way out in uh, Southampton, New York. Um, I too am a guest to Lenape Hoking today. So I drove out with my car uh, two hours. And I also wanna thank um, Dr. Uh, Crouch for inviting me to be on the panel today. Um, within 10 minutes, I wanna talk a little bit about um, where I come from, the Shinnecock Nation, um, a background to our history and how it relates to the work that I do as a visual artist. So primarily I do digital photography, what you see uh, maybe on Zoom and um, a lot of my <laughs> uh, presentation is on slides, so I'm more of a visual learner. But these are some of my portfolios that actually respond to history and actually try to uplift history. Um, when I was growing up, people always told me that um, Native history was so long ago, why are you still st so stuck on that? So sometimes you need to, as an artist, um, remix it. That's the word I like to use. Um, re-envision it, and finally give Indigenous perspectives to a history that um, really was um, set by someone else. So we can go to the uh, next slide. <laughs> Thank you. So this is the uh, Shinnecock Community Center. Um, this is a very special building to me because my grandfather, um, Avery Dennis Sr., um, in the 1950s, he was a trustee, one of our three leaders at the time, and he was instrumental in getting this building built. So it's where our tribal offices are. We also have weddings here, um, community and tribal meetings, and for some reason, a basketball court. So it's very <laughs> multi-purpose. Um, just a little bit of background uh, about Shinnecock. There's about 600 of us who live here on the territory. 
even though it's only about 800 square acres or one mile north to south. But in total, our enrollment is about 1,800 tribal members. So we live all over the world. There's several reasons for that. Uh, during the 17th century, when uh, slavery was still practiced on Long Island, the way that we were punished, um, often arbitrarily, was that we would be given fines or fees that would be impossible for us to pay to punish us um, tangibly. They would uh, ship our ancestors far away, usually to West Africa or the Caribbeans. So there's descendants that we aren't even um, in touch with. Um, we also have relatives who are in uh, Wisconsin, uh, the Brotherton Indian Nation. They are still fighting for state and federal recognition, but we at Shinnecock just received ours relatively recently in 2010. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide as well. Uh, this is a satellite image of our territory, and it looked pretty uh, spacious, um, but the bottom one third of our uh, territory is actually marshland, so it looks very green. Um, it's what is known as, um, or the, the area is known as the Hamptons today. So there's a lot of um, McMansions or mansions as they're called, uh, overabundance, there's uh, overdevelopment right upon the water. But in contrast, if you look at Shinnecock's territory, it's almost like a nature reserve. There's species of fauna, um, uh, mammals, birds that you've never seen if you're just across the water in Southampton. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is our tribal seal and our flag. Um, when we received our federal recognition in 2010, we joined over 570 other federally recognized tribes. And there's even more than that that are state recognized. And uh, as Dr. Crouch said, um, those who are not recognized as at all, but working on it. And so um, if you're familiar with the medicine wheel, I always like to point out the yellow as the primary color. Um, yellow is typically the rising sun or the easternmost quadrant of the medicine wheel, which is uh, true with our geographic region on the East Coast. We also feature the two Atlantic right whales on the bottom, the indigenous box turtle, and um, Algonquin on the left as part of our uh, cultural umbrella. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as an artist, I always like to appreciate um, wampum bead manufacturing. I don't practice it myself, but trying to envision my ancestors doing this practice um, 400 plus years ago is just astonishing. So I'm sure we've all walked the beach, we've seen clamshells uh, perhaps with this purple um, hue in it. And so for thousands of years, my ancestors have been taking this very delicate clamshell and rendering it into beads. And it's a very delicate process to both manufacture and once you get the beads to actually turn it into a belt or an accessory. And so this is a practice that's still done today. The Unkachag have a business called Wampum Magic. And if you come to our powwow, um, you could probably actually purchase um, one piece for yourself. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is perhaps the most uh, famous example of beads turning into, into something beautiful. This is the Haudenosaunee Iroquois Confederacy belt. And there's a immense history associated with it and a lot of symbolism. But this is one of the reasons my ancestors um, came to Lenape Hoking, or what is now New York City. They would bring the beads and um, allow the upstate indigenous communities to create these magnificent um, belts and other accessories. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is one of our most important maps. It's dated uh, 1797. And of course, I put a, a green rectangle around our current day reservation. Um, everything in this darker tone used to be Shinnecock Reserve. Uh, no matter where you look, it either says Indian Meeting House, uh, Shinnecock Indian Nation Reserve, Shinnecock Great Neck, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing that is missing from this map is the Long Island Railroad. And so in 1859, um, Arthur Benson made shady deals with Southampton proprietors and ended up outright stripping this land from Shinnecock. And so just for an example of like the inflation that we're all experiencing today in the real estate industry, we just recently in 2021 um, purchased our sacred um, Sugarloaf Hill. It's about a parcel that's maybe two acres in total. And that alone costs $5 million. And so what is owed to Shinnecock is um, incalculable and our uphill battle to regain this land is uh, hard to imagine. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a map by Shinnecock artist David Bonmartin. 
it illustrates um, what is known as the 13 communities of Long Island from Brooklyn to Montauk. And of course, there's these hard boundaries in this illustration, but of course there was no <laughs> fences. And in fact, these are place names. And so when the colonists actually came to Eastern Long Island in 1640, they met the Shinnecock. We didn't call ourselves Shinnecock. We had uh, family names and individual names, but in order to make it easier to steal land from us, they assigned large swaths of land, uh, different names. And that was a, a means in order to actually um, label, uh, disseminate, and categorize lands for later um, land transactions. And in fact, throughout the 1600s, all the way up to the 1800s, um, Shinnecock ancestors, for example, were living on land that they didn't know was actually um, removed or had any transaction associated with them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is another really incredible map. Uh, if you're on Zoom or if you're sitting in the audience, you can kind of see how um, poorly <laughs> detailed it is. But this is really incredible because if you if you know where Hampton Base is today, it has the old name Good Ground, and that actually used to be our prim primary residence um, as Shinnecock people. So this is proof of that. And it is such a poor quality map because when you go to Southampton Town um, Hall and you ask them for documents like this, they'll ask you like, what's wrong? What, what is this document that you're trying to request? We don't have anything like that. But if you ask them about land transactions, of course, they'll readily have it and digitize and um, put it right in your face if you're Shinnecock. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a, another image I really love. This is my mother and aunt. Um, this is on the day of our federal recognition. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> and just to illustrate the immense amount of unique uh, tribal nations throughout the United States, um, this is a good map that illustrates that. There's even more up-to-date maps you can actually buy, and you can uh, get a magnifying glass and uh, see Shinnecock on it. Uh, funnily enough, this map doesn't feature Shinnecock. It actually features the Montauket of Eastern Long Island. And if y'all are following the news, they um, just had a bill in recognition vetoed by Governor Hochul. So it's ironic that there's so much history that acknowledges them, yet it just takes one person to um, deny their existence. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so at Shinnecock, we're most known for our annual Labor Day weekend powwow. If you haven't come out, the dates for this year are September 1st to the 4th. And so this is a great way to uh, engage with living indigenous peoples. It's the largest on the East Coast and more than 40,000 people come through each uh, four day weekend. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, a lot of the work that I do is actually portraiture. So it spans the um, uh, array from documentary work all the way to post-production Photoshop, uh, manipulating different elements and trying to stage photos. Um, but today I'm just gonna do a surface level overview of some of my projects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in addition to traditional dance and art and craft at our powwow, we have a new tradition of canoeing. So this is to come to Caesar and this is an organization or a, um, a program by Christian Weaver, who's also Shinnecock. Uh, next slide, please. And rather than celebrating Thanksgiving each year, we actually celebrate Nanua, which is an Algonquin word for our harvest ce um, celebration. So we invite the public. We have um, large gatherings. Each table is intentionally mixed between Shinnecock residents and non-native uh, visitors. And this is a great way to undo the segregation and um, divisions that we see in our country in Suffolk County here on Long Island, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so just to um, show, I always like to show the uh, corn, bean, and squash or the three sisters, just because even still today, we have that mindset that uh, natives were primitive, they were nomadic, they didn't know how to cultivate. And yet this is one of the uh, traditional thousand year old recipes that we celebrate and serve. Uh, next slide, <laughs> thank you. And so, um, there's a little bit of a whaling history that we're associated with. It's part of our identity. Even still, we fight for the uh, survivance of right whales in the Atlantic. Um, one thing that's threatening them right now is the wind turbine industry. Uh, next slide, please. And even though we don't um, hunt whales today, we try to preserve them as much as possible. One thing that we do do on the, uh, on the coastline 
is try to undo erosion. So it's a very small territory that's threatened by climate change each year. We have even more and more uh, erosion. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so this is actually based on the um, NOAA uh, predictions. And on the left is present day sea, le um, sea lines or coastlines. And on the right is 10 feet of sea level rise. And so if you notice um, Shinnecock Reservation, which is right in the middle, is that peninsula surrounded by water on three sides. Uh, for some reason, this is the most affected landscape that will be underwater uh, in that time. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> um, and so uh, I won't jump into it too much right now. Uh, this is a project I've been doing since 2016 called On the Site Indigenous Long Island. And so it's an interactive map. You can either engage with it through Google Maps or you can search image by image. But it's a, a survey of Long Island's indigenous history from 10,000 years ago, hopefully to the present, if I catch up to um, modern times. Um, can we actually go two slides ahead to? Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> So these are some of the articles that I came across in my research. So again, I'm a um, visual artist first and I appreciate history second, I would say. And so a lot of the practice is going into libraries, scanning old documents and digitizing them. So that finally, when you Google Shinnecock Indian Nation, it's not just a paragraph on Wikipedia um, that talks about the golf course. Um, next slide, please. And um, just as, we're used to with Wikipedia, it's very accessible. There's keywords, there's table of contents, there's um, knowledge bases, et cetera. Next slide, please. And so one of the sites, there's over 200 featured. This is Sugarloaf Hill. Um, if you can see the mansion on the hilltop, that's where the site is located. We as Shinnecock people uh, traditionally use hilltops as our sacred burial sites. So according to ground pen uh, penetrating radar, we just recently learned that over 10,000 of our ancestors are buried on this one plot that in the 1990s, uh, Southampton town allowed to be desecrated. So the house was built right on that burial site. And finally in 2021, we purchased it for $5 million. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and next to that, just five minutes down the road is the Shinnecock monument. So if you have seen uh, Trevor Noah's um, segment on this, there's a humorous take on Michael Costa actually renting out this Shinnecock monument. This is part of our economic development. It was built in 2019 on Montauk Highway, and it's still standing today. And it's amazing that we have these 3,000-year-old cultural sites next to 21st century um, infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is the uh, to-do list for the project. Um, in a sense, uh, the purpose is to show that Indigenous people are still here. Um, if you've grown up in the public school, um, education system, it tries to teach you otherwise. I think there's so much history that unfortunately isn't um, something that makes us proud. Um, there's a lot of conflict. Um, if you live on Long Island, chances are you might live on stolen lands. And so what I try to do is make it easy and accessible through free um, access and many different ways as an entry point. Next slide, please. Um, and so New York Times just recently published this article on the left. It kind of is a survey of all of indigenous um, New York state issues that we've had in the last five years from the Seneca funds being um, seized and frozen to the Unmarked Graves Protection Act being vetoed along with this image on the right that mentions more specifically the Montaukets being um, their, their recognition being vetoed as well. And so we can go to the next slide as well. Um, these are just a couple of links. I just went very quickly through the images and the articles, but if you want to see more about the On This Site project, please visit jeremynative.com slash on this site. Um, I think the last slide is back to the panel. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> I feel so fortunate to be sharing this space with the both of you. Um, you know, I have so many questions, but I, I guess one thing I want to ask each of you is what has been the biggest obstacle to, and on the flip side, the most positive surprise of educating people about these indigenous histories and experiences and presences? 
Uh, I'll go ahead and start and say the bit, my experience as I go up and down Lenape Hokey and and uh, I do a lot of these types of uh, presentations just to let people know about us. I mean, significant erasure of the Lenape people and even the institutions in the city of New York City, uh, museums and, you know, I mean, look folks, when they had the Lenape in our history in the American Museum of Natural History, natural history so we're like in our identity is informing people as if we were like back with the mastodons you know that we don't exist anymore that you don't see us you know that's the hardest part and so it's this education and i cannot share this knowledge without telling the truth as i have learned it's not the words of the Lenape people, our history telling is a oral tradition. A lot of the research I've done has been through the writings of missionaries, military generals, uh, military governors, merchants, historians, scientists, They've written about this history, but with the lens of manifest destiny. So it's it's a challenge to tell our story, which identifies a lot of problems that we would need another afternoon to talk about the residual or remaining effects of settler colonialism. It wasn't just being removed from the past, but it's that depending on which native nation, a trail of tears, or as I call ours, a trail of broken treaties. It's that historical and generational trauma that still manifests itself in psychological and physical and medical issues that exist in our people today as we are separated from our homeland and have had to adapt and adopt ways that are foreign to our origins just to survive. So those are the challenges. The, I just only spoke a little bit about mm -hmm. it, but um, you know, I, I have so far have found friendly audiences that are, uh, that will listen to this. And my challenge to them is look within your own institution, your church, your school, your business, your city government, your state government, look within those institutions, look deep. And are, are they still carrying those vestiges, those, those remaining precepts that establishes their authority and their dominance. And look deep inside, do, do people even today realize that in many cases you are on the unceded ancestral territory of the Lenape? And no, we didn't just, sure, you take it, we'll, we'll just, we'll go somewhere else. Y'all, y'all take this here. No didn't occur like that at all. And not only look at it, is racism and settler colonialism, the vestiges of that, still the foundation of today's institutions. And then did that inform generations of people to the way they operate those institutions? Look, that, that could be the church, right? Catholic Church is really dealing with this issue right now. But it's like, well, you know, I think and Lenape people think in a circle like this. So, you know, that phrase, well, what goes around comes around. And we're dealing with those issues today. 
And that's why I'm saying that Lenape people can bring their traditional knowledge and their experience of having been marginalized and pushed away and help to find a way to facilitate our return and let us bring traditional knowledge back to the table that may address things like climate change. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. All right. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, I, I am a person that believes that if I'm going to bring forward a problem, I should bring forward a solution. Because if I wait around for the other guy to think about it and try to come up with a solution to the problem, well, so far it hadn't happened. So, but I, I come in good spirit and goodwill, but I will not back down from the assertion of the Lenape people who are the original people of this land and we were given a responsibility to take care of it in a way for future generations. And I want to be one of those descendants that does just that. Yeah. Uh, well, with my um, on the site project, one of the positive things I've uh, experienced, uh, thank you, <laughs> um, is that uh, the website itself, like I'm very bad at coding websites and maintaining it. It's on a platform called WordPress and I actually took a, um, web, uh, um, a restaurant review website and turned it into a history and site specific website. So it crashes a lot and social studies teachers actually uh, email me immediately to tell me <laughs> like I'm working on a, a curriculum. I can't access the site. This is the only way I can find this info for Long Island Native history. And so I think that's really refreshing because usually I think public school curriculum limits it to one grade and one segment about Native history for K through 12. And it's really refreshing to hear that uh, teachers are going out of their way to actually include us. And that's not a easy task. Um, I think that they themselves have also went from zero to teaching it to others. And that's true with my experience. So I was uh, 25 years old when I started the On the Site project, and it was really rewarding to just learn something, share it moments later, and all of us uh, benefiting from that. that. Um, the challenge, um, as Dr. Crouch and uh, Curtis mentioned, um, I think land acknowledgments are very trendy right now. Um, I think they've been with us for several years, and I think it was uh, 2020, I was looking at Twitter, and someone had a hot take, it was... Um, 2020 was the year that white people uh, did land acknowledgements, but continued to live on native land. So I'm always wondering, like, how can we avoid the text and the focus on that towards how can we have action? And has, as uh, Curtis said, uh, the amazing uh, goal that I think we're all trying to work towards is having uh, descendants return to Aboriginal traditional territories. That's so. That's true for Shinnecock. We want to regain our stolen sacred hills in the Shinnecock Hills. We also want a seat at the table, as Curtis said. So um, that's one way to undo climate change. The other is to um, move away from capitalism, if that's a possibility, just because everything that we um, enact today is some sort of um, whoever's the top bidder, um, whoever has the most money has the best voice. And so that's usually not true with indigenous communities. So that's something that I'm hopeful that it's a mindset that needs to be shifted rather than um, anything else. So I'm curious in order to, to realize what the both of you are putting forward, what you would say to non-Indigenous folks who want to stand in solidarity with the kind of work that you're doing, what kinds of steps are tangible that can be taken to support this work? I know, Curtis, you mentioned a little bit about thinking about our own places within institutions, um, but are there other things that the two of you have found to be particularly effective or meaningful? Well, I guess I have to first go ahead and put in a plug for my nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> Lenape Center, that's L-E-N like Nancy, A-P like Peter. E, Lenape. So if you go online and look look us up, it's the Lenape Center, all one word, 
www.thepeopleshow.com. Our website tells about our organization. Uh, look as we go forth and present Lenape culture in a both a traditional but contemporary way. We would appreciate appreciate your support of our organization as we engage in everything from agriculture to music. Look, folks, um, one of our directors of Lenape Center is an accomplished musician and composer of orchestral works, opera. He just wrote a piece. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm a little starstruck by my friend, but we were standing on the stage of Carnegie Hall Monday night presenting this brand new work orchestral work honoring the Lenape ancestors. So to be able to present in large and small groups, just learning about us and following what we do would be helpful. I gotta also then put in a plug for my particular niche of work that I'm engaged in right now. Uh, a significant part of my work for Lenape Center is I'm fulfilling a partnership that was struck uh, in the Hudson Valley with a uh, corporate farm that provided some, uh, some fertile ground for us to plant ancestral crops. And now I'm starting my second year as a farmer and a gardener growing ancestral crops. So uh, we're planting and growing uh, sesopsing. It's a, a blue flint corn, beans, squash, that's the three sisters, tobacco, sunflower, sunchokes, gourds. The corn, I'm trying to grow a big stand of corn, but as I talked about Dutch merchants writing about us, like back in the 17th, in the mid 17th century. And you've got these guys writing, you know, in their journals about, oh yeah, the Lenape, they're over there in that valley, they're growing corn, right? And like 400 years later, I'm a Lenape descendant growing that corn. These are ancestral seeds. They've, they've been passed down over generations. We found this particular bunch, at a seed library at the University of Iowa, but we took them back to the homeland, put them into the earth, and then we're growing them in just like the ancestors. That's how I'm getting connected back to the homeland. I'm digging my fingers into the earth. I'm giving thanks. I put tobacco down and give thanks, and I say little prayers to connect with the spirit of the land and the water, the homeland, the ground where the ancestor bones are buried. That's the best way that I can return and honor the ancestors is instead of repatriation, it's rematriation, putting seeds into the earth and bringing them forward. Now that's the kind of activity we do. And if anybody wants to come out later this summer and help me pull weeds, <laughs> I've just get a hold of me. I, we could probably do that. Thank you. Um, well, individual impact is always important. Um, I'm thinking about our annual Labor Day weekend powwow. Um, it always changes every year. There's always different programs and presenters. And for um, it's not just unique to Shinnecock, but um, I think some surveys say that more than a third of Native communities identify as artists or craftspeople or dancers. So um, this is just a four-day weekend out of the year that we get our major revenue. So we go powwow to powwow throughout the summer, and then we live off that and continue to craft for the rest of the year. So coming out, um, spending money, buying gifts, buying food, and getting tickets is a major um, source of revenue for us. So that's one invitation. Um, at the same time, you can come and visit Ma's house. That's the uh, communal art space I'm trying to uplift and develop. That's also on the Shinnecock territory. And I always think about um, just different ways that there's still room to listen to Indigenous people. 
So I'm actually the um, acting TIPO, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Shinnecock. So there's something called Section 106. It's a um, process where the federal government has to correspond and communicate with tribal nations um, whenever there's building on federal or public lands. And so usually it's the experience of them telling me something. And uh, if I do have input, it's like, thanks, but we're going to do our own thing because we're the federal government. And so there's so many opportunities where you're just told things. And then if you ask for things, if you're indigenous, you get no as an answer. And so living in the Hamptons, one of the things I always think about, um, if anyone does have that connection or space, is the fact that, um, I guess it's true in the city too, there's so much vacant space, um, uh, whether that's storefronts, whether that's uh, vacant housing that could go to uh, Shinnecock people in our territory, Lenape people here. And um, I'm also just not a big fan of um, golf courses. That's another <laughs> issue. So I apologize to golf courses in the audience. But there's so many ways that if we listen to indigenous people, there's different ways to steward the land. And I think that Curtis is um, leading that example by um, providing food, taking care of the land, reintroducing indigenous crops, for example. Thank you. Would you be willing to see some questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay, sure. <laughs> so um, if you are joining us online, Please just type your questions in and Caroline will read the questions out. I'll repeat them. Um, in fact, I'm going to repeat everyone's questions so that we can hear, but I just saw a hand go up in the back of the room. Yes, please, sir. Does everyone, we all have oral tradition, but many indigenous people have symbolic spirits in the world. Have you, have you dealt with the language of, of that? So the question is um, the maintenance of symbolic script systems in addition to the importance of the preservation and continuation of indigenous languages. Um, which were efforts that you talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll go ahead and try that because I'm trying to in interpret the word symbolic script. When I go ahead, sir. It's not an outfit, and it doesn't exist as yeah. scripture, as told by Tolan, and other symbolic script. Okay, uh, yeah, symbolic script then. Uh, uh, would be images that perhaps wouldn't be like, you know, a written language, but the equivalent of. And the Lenape certainly had that. I mean, we weren't without a language and a way of conveying that uh, without even having it spoken. But um, I guess in time we had to learn the way the Europeans provided script to consecrate everything from uh, uh, occupancy agreements to probably the most important part. The Lenape at this point are about, I'd say with the Delaware tribe alone, which I'm enrolled in, they're like 90%, 92%, 3% Christian, converted into Christian. And uh, Many, including my father, his his father, his parents, they went through the uh, Indian boarding schools or residential schools. Mm -hmm. So to be indoctrinated and to be converted, that's something that has been going on for hundreds of years. And so the the, the symbolic script I'm thinking of is that holy Bible that has been held up to people to. Uh, provide them a, a new identity. And the phenomenon that's going on today is people, and particularly a younger generation that is looking for some kind of balance of growing up in a Christian environment, and yet this traditional way that was non-Christian, and trying to find some kind of a balance. Now, uh, I will say that I have been a part of uh, uh, supporting the establishment of a very robust online language website that is the 
uh, property of the Delaware tribe of Indians. But we took old recordings from the Smithsonian over the years, starting in the 70s, and managed to, with the digital age, digitally convert them, put them on a website, and create an interactive website where you can go and put in words in English, have them translated into Lenape, listen to stories spoken by elders nearly 100 years ago in old recordings and looking at modern day recordings, including video recordings of conversational Lenape between generations. So those are the new symbolic texts for us. Um, and that's just part of adaptation in order to survive. That's That's been our experience. Hmm. Uh, well, maybe I'll add on to Curtis's answer. Uh, when I think about your question and the idea of assimilation, we had this uh, wampum belt that was the two row wampum belt. And it was often given from indigenous communities to European powers. And it was meant to represent that this is your community, this is us. If we stay in our lanes, we'll be able to live together. And of course, we know that historically that didn't happen. It was more like they um, saw us, us as lesser and that we need to convert because we were primitive, we were pagans, etc. And so that's one form of seeing a picture and it meaning some sort of narrative, some sort of treaty, some sort of agreement. And so there's so many of those um, symbols that have been lost just because if you can imagine over thousands of years, there were tens of thousands of these belts and beads being made. But in recent times, unfortunately, when administrations change or there was misunderstandings, they would see these organic belt materials and they think, oh, this might come from a flea market. This is just garbage. This is meaningless. But for us, it's one of our ancient um, sacred objects. So many of them were fortunately lost. But throughout Long Island, there were other pictographs as well. There were other symbols that we still have yet to interpret their um, original meaning. But it's, it is something that we're still interested in. Yeah, Carolyn. We have a lot of questions um, in the chat, but I'll start with a few uh, comments from you. It says, I go to Queens College, which is one of the best in the world, but the two of them are in the But there are no indigenous present from here. How can a non native like myself facilitate indigenous culture and events to the Queens College? Do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah. Okay, so um, a question from someone who attends Queens College, which is uh, one of the most diverse campuses in the world, and yet has not really manifested any indigenous presence. What is the best way to be able to bring this into that space? Uh, I'll say something on behalf of uh, the Lenape language. Uh, I just mentioned that there are resources available including the online website, which we call the Lenape Talking Dictionary. It's uh, talk-lenape.org. But uh, how do we get indigenous language into in institutions? This is something I'm juggling with right now. We were, uh, my uh, co-director, uh, Joe Baker and I were uh, at, uh, State University of New York graduate school talking to their language program. But to start the Lenape language at SUNY New York, when the question becomes how many Lenape people are out there? I mean, I look from my standpoint, why would you want to learn Lenape unless we're going to talk to each other in Lenape? It shouldn't be treated like something that's just like a, an elective in school. Oh, I think I'll learn French or, you know, like that. That's uh, just my own personal opinion. So there has to be a reason for learning it. And then not only that, then the institution has to support adding that. And how are you going to add that? Are you going to hire someone to go to the website and do all of that work so you can offer this elective out there and it looks neat in our family of languages. Yeah, you could do that. But I'm one that says, all right, if you really want to do it, 
then you indigenize your institution. You put a Lenape speaker in the faculty and you provide them the basic support to get into the institution. And here's another thing. We don't have PhDs in Lenape. And institutions often require, you gotta have that PhD next to your name so that you can qualify to get on the payroll and you know all of these. It, look, I got a PhD in Lenape, but I, it's not from some institution. It's 40, <laughs> it's 40 years of work that I've done. And I've been all over Lenape country. So, you know, uh, but I don't, have, I don't have that academic stuff. But we need to indigenize the institution in order to teach it because it's more than just an interpretation of some words and coming out of my mouth. There's a spirit in that language that you're channeling ancestors when you're doing it. That's also another way of dealing with the healing of historical and generational trauma. And so uh, with all respect to bringing a Lenape language to an institution like that, I would just as soon hit, uh, point them in the direction of existing resources and talk to these communities in order to bring a genuine representation. There's a responsibility for speaking the words of the ancestors. And it should, that responsibility should be borne by the Lenape ancestors and they need to be shown away, provided away, and supported to do that work. And there might be meaning then in the work done through institutions like this college. Sorry, I got off in that direction, but <laughs> they're not easy to answer in a couple of words. <laughs> uh, well, representing the um, Algonquin language and culture, there's actually a, a SUNY Stony Brook class that's online on Zoom. And it's uh, either free to attend or it's about $40 if you pay for extras. But it's actually um, led by Mohegan, um, Unkichag, and Shinnecock tribal members. So it's a really amazing uh, class because historically, the reason we still have our language is because they uh, took the Bible, turned it into Algonquin, um, actually the Natick um, dialect in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And now we're uh, reverse engineering it. So. Um, there's a whole bunch of different steps of grammatical change. How do you make it so you can be fluent in it? And so at this point, they're actually learning and shifting it at the same time as they're teaching it. So there are moments in class where a student who's very um, adept sometimes corrects the teacher. So it's a dynamic language that's uh, living, which is, I think, true of language um, all around the world. I'll just add that as somebody who works at an institution of higher education, um, student activism drives a lot of change, right? The reason that my institution has been able to gain traction is not because I'm a very squeaky wheel, although I can be. It's because I can point to students saying, we want indigenous faculty. We want visitors to come here and feel welcome. We want not just to recruit students, but to retain students. And retention means people need to be seen. They need to be comfortable. They need to know that there are elders there. They need to know there are people that they can talk to who are faculty and staff and their peers. And so I think there's a lot that can be done by students in getting administrations and faculty to see that this is something of value to them. And if it's a value to the students, people will respond. So that's just as an, as an aside, mm -hmm. I know we've got more questions. But I would like to submit one other response. And that is, uh, I think that these institutions could be helpful in a way. You have to look at the history of the geography, but there are so many place names in our language that still exist. And I think that uh, we can provide education and interpretation of those place names and the meaning why that's given that name in the native predominantly in Algonquin based languages. And then likewise, I advocate being part of a movement where we start co-naming streets like the Broadway. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a native name for that too. So there, there is work that's possible ahead in a partnership with native and non-native uh, scholars, uh, and linguists. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, 
kids. I just want to, I want to jump in to talk about my reason and doing my question. The first one is a little one. I think you might have thought of kids. You might have thought of kids as well. Um, I mean, it's all too many children who are using the summer for a living in space and bringing them a thousand years slowly to school. Um, especially given the so moving through that whole time to get to school is not easy. Um, I'm from Hungary. I'm not a native born. So my family is in there because I'm a children's book party. I work as an artist with the dad who's here in her. Um, is understanding that a lot of my identity and why the, the, the privilege that I have, the way that I'm living around the world, is because of the students um, as an uninvited member of the community. So I mean, first of all, we really start by something that you said, you said that the foundation of all things culture is language. And I just believe that, and I just want to offer that. Um, and I'm going to that. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to offer that, um, I think it's even to be a reflection coming to a space in which ancestral knowledge is going to be increased and learning and not really especially when you're doing some good, but the learning of the language itself, because the people live in the land, the folks that live in the land live, starts to or opening opens the door open and um understanding seeing the world of um, and so I have a completely understand what you're saying. But trying to show that I think it is a the the more of the language is spoken, the more of the perspective of the people is understood, the more it can be. The question is, are there any classes that you're aware of for nothing like this? Like you're not private institutions or you know, that might not be super formal in that place to be welcome to be home. All right, our uh uh, our audience member here is asking, are there Lenape language lessons going on right now that people can access, whether they are in person or online? Uh, uh, well, I, I mean, I know that uh, my my tribe in Oklahoma has, they are doing some classes uh, virtually, you know, Zoom classes and that. I don't know the calendar, uh, but you know, it's they're a little bit more dynamic than just the stationary websites. Um, I don't know about the other communities right now, right? Uh, and I'll I'll only list the fairly recognized because I have a working knowledge about them. But you have two bands of Delaware in the state of Oklahoma. You have two bands of Delaware in Southern Ontario, Canada. They've been there like since the 1790s. And then you have a band of uh, Muncie's and Stockbridge together that have been on a reservation in Wisconsin since like 1856. They all have language programs going on. I know they have some on-reservation stuff, but uh, some of them might do online and makes it social media. And these conveniences have made it much more uh, accessible that way. Uh, it's just working the dynamic to make it happen. I don't know of any institutions in the uh, city of New York that has any kind of classes going on. And that's not something that Lenape Center is currently engaged in at this time. We're more in a consulting, trying to kind of feel out where a good fit might be. And as I said, it might be at history uh, in the museums and in uh, uh, place names, geographical place names and that we, we kind of get that uh, dynamic going. But I do uh, agree with you that if the more the language of the indigenous people is spoken in the current context, it evokes recognition and respect. And that's a good start. Maybe one more question from online, is yeah. that okay? So we have a question from the audience. They say, thank you for a really good speaking. I would love to hear a little more about the speaking 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 about the
but um, in the Algonquin class that I took, um, I thought it was really interesting because right now there's a lot of dialogue about identity politics and gender. And in Algonquin, there's um, there's not gender differentiation, it's living versus non-living. And so when you grow up in a society that um, reinforces gender as being two different things, like you said, it's the foundation of our culture. And uh, speaking about Western Africa, um, a lot of the work that I um, pull from um, the history is by Dr. Gaynell Stone. So um, Dr. Stone has a huge, basically a tome about Shinnecock people that I pull from, just like an endless source of knowledge that I try to digitize, create art from, and new interpretations. And um, she actually went to the Caribbean. It wasn't West Africa, but um, recalled seeing people who looked like my relatives, looked like my cousins, and just the idea that on both sides of the um, Shinnecock diaspora, perhaps we don't know <laughs> um, the half of our ancestors who are out there in the world still living. And we have this connection that um, isn't being fulfilled. So that's something that I want to explore. Um, maybe it'll be like a Fulbright project or something, but um, there's definitely a lot of room for research and reconnecting uh, kinship. I see Melissa's coming up, which means I think we're at time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're out of time. Yeah. Um, I want to thank each of you for coming and lending um, your knowledge and expertise today. This has been a really eye-opening experience. Um, I also uh, want to thank all of you for attending our uh, second Dykeman Discussions panel. On your way out, we will have surveys you can fill out to provide feedback um, so we can continually improve um, our process. And our next Dykeman discussion panel is on the Atlantic slave trade and will take place on April 20th at 2 p.m. And it will take place at PS 98, which is at 212th Street. And I just wanna thank you all again for coming.